Well, guys, we have reached the end of yet another year in film. 2022 was one of the craziest, most busy times of my entire life, shooting a film for the very first time, being a dad. Of course, that was a holdover from 2021, but continuing and learning how to raise kids and making a movie and seeing films and continuing the channel. It's just been a whirlwind of a year for me, and I'm glad to still be here talking with you guys we survived it. We're here. This has actually, I think, been a great year for movies. I think it's been the best year for movies since 2019. And as usual, guys, you know the drill. If you have a list, I'd love to know it. Let me know below. Choices on this list aren't necessarily going to reflect your choices. And I must also stress that I don't really consider myself a film critic anymore in a professional sense. I'm sort of just someone who really loves movies now and is also making them and talks with you guys about them. And hopefully you enjoy that. I don't like lists. This is the one time of year I do it, and let's have some fun. As I said, this was a really good year. I considered making this a top 15 list, but we're going to stick with top 10, and for that reason, I have some honorable mentions, films I loved but that didn't quite make the list, including Hustle, The Black Phone, You Can Live Forever, Pearl, Triangle of Sadness, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, The Quiet Girl, Women Talking, Living, The Fablemans, the Whale, Tar, and Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. For clarity, Puss in Boots 2 would be number 11. It would be right at the start of this list if I extended it beyond 10. This year was just really good. And there's going to be some films I talk about that I haven't reviewed. And there's films that I have reviewed. You can search on my channel. But I also want to do something special this year. I want to introduce a new category. I don't know if it will continue. But for this year especially, I want to give a mention to a film that was made for me. This is not one of the best films of the year. It's just a film that was made for my exact emotional state. And I saw it three times. I saw it at a drive-in. I saw it at an XD theater in Cinemark. I saw it like many times with friends and with Sam and we geeked out. And it's the shirt I'm wearing. Dragon Ball Super, Superhero, was a cathartic experience for a Dragon Ball fan to see Gohan and Piccolo take center stage, and so many fun things happened for me. I recognize that this is by no means one of the best films of the year. It's just a film that was perfect for me, and I really loved going to the theater watching it. I can't say that I've ever seen a film quite like RRR. Muscles, blood, sweat, tears, and dancing. I shouted at the screen in excitement more than any other film this year. I saw two men become one body and run through a forest killing people. I saw a great proof of concept for a Turok movie. RRR was magnificent. Till is no doubt one of the year's most disturbing and emotionally stirring films, but also one of the most important. I saw this movie in theaters this year, and some of the images in it stayed with me for probably a week, but even more so the thoughts behind the film and the inspiration that you feel towards the end stayed with me for much longer. I found this movie to be absolutely devastating. I knew of the story. I knew of the facts behind it, but to watch Danielle Detweiler's Oscar-worthy performance was to feel the emotion of Emmett Till's mother, Mammy. I'm assuming most of you haven't even heard of this movie, or if you have, you haven't watched it yet. I would strongly encourage you to do just that. This year, Mark Rylance has gotten a lot of buzz about his performance in Bones and All, a film that I enjoyed, but nowhere near as much as The Outfit. I think Mark Rylance is magnificent in this film, which is essentially like a stage play. It takes place entirely inside a tailor shop. Mark Rylance's character is a cutter, someone who makes suits, sews them together, sizes up his customers, and he also happens to allow the mob 
to come in and make drops at his store. But on one fateful night, his store becomes a hideout for the mob as they try to locate a crucial piece of evidence that could incriminate them. This is a tense thriller unlike any other film this year. It was made by the same people behind the imitation game and for some reason hasn't gotten the attention that film got. It was absolutely wonderful. I saw this movie in one of the only theaters near me that was showing it, Chagrin Cinemas, which by the way, in January is closing. Rest in peace. I've gone to that theater a few times. It's one of the last old school theaters nearby that still has old arcades and you could smell the popcorn and the carpet. It's one of those theaters and I love seeing this movie there and I hope you guys check it out because I do think it's one of the most overlooked films of the year. This was an incredible audience experience at Fantastic Fest. Everyone in the theater was into this movie. It has so many great jokes. It's so fun. The idea of combining the cutthroat restaurant world with death and murder and mind games was genius. Ray Fiennes gave one of my favorite performances of the year. As a chef at his wit's end with society and the way they treat restaurant workers, I thought this was a brilliant satire from beginning to end. I loved everything about it. This is a breakup story in many ways about two friends who live on a remote island. And all of a sudden, one of them just decides that he doesn't want to be friends with the other anymore. One of the brilliant things about the movie is exactly why that is. Because there's a lot of tension initially with Brendan Gleeson's character, because he doesn't want to talk to Colin Farrell's character. And Colin Farrell is just like this nice kind of innocent guy who doesn't understand what's going on. As the film progresses and the relationship gets worse and worse, Martin McDonough's dialogue and his blocking and his setup of scenes and his beautiful location made this a thrilling movie, especially if you love great dialogue. All of Martin McDonough's films are written beautifully, and this is one of his best. Skipping this movie when it was in limited release before its eventual streaming on Amazon Prime is one of my great regrets in cinema this year. I really wish that I had seen 13 Lives in a theater because this, in every way, feels like a movie that they don't make anymore. Ron Howard spent a ton of money to tell the true story of a rescue that happened in a series of caves when a bunch of kids in Thailand got stranded when a cave system was flooded. This is a true story, there have been documentaries about it, and a lot of people know the outcome, but that didn't stop this movie from being absolutely tense from beginning to end. And the one thing that really stuck with me when I was researching it after I saw it was divers were commenting on the accuracy of the film, specifically divers who were actually involved with the rescue. And they said that it was incredibly accurate except for one detail, and that is that they had zero visibility when they were diving through this cave system. In the film, you can at least see in the water. In real life, it was just mud. And when I thought about that, after watching how intense the film experience is, you realize the true heroes that are out there. If you haven't seen this film yet, definitely check it out. It's on Amazon Prime. It's a big return to form for Ron Howard. Ryan Johnson continues to revitalize the detective genre with Glass Onion. I'm so glad I got to see this in a theater this year before it went to streaming on Netflix. I found this movie hilarious. I thought the mystery was investing. Daniel Craig's Benoit Blanc is once again one of the most exciting new characters we have in a franchise. And I honestly like this one just as much as the first. I loved the midpoint turn that happens, how you learn more about Janelle Monae's character at that point. I love how Ryan Johnson was able to keep so much from me as someone who's very well trained to see things coming in movies. I think his screenplay is wonderful and worthy of an Oscar nomination. If you keep complaining about originality being dead or Hollywood being out of ideas or whatever, you're just not seeing enough movies because this year, everything everywhere all at once came out and it blew me away. I loved the Daniels' first film, Swiss Army Man, and so I wasn't surprised that everything was so good. 
and that they were so talented. But this is clearly a step above that absolutely hilarious film about a farting corpse. Michelle Yeoh is Oscar worthy. The action sequences are thrilling, but more importantly, the emotional core of this movie is so intact and so tangible, and you really feel like you know these characters. The Daniels pulled off a miracle with this film. If you've ever tried to make a movie and you look at the movie from like the perspective of maybe like a first AD who's trying to schedule everything, it's just unimaginable that the film got made in the way that it is and that it is so good and that so many people jumped behind this insane idea. It really does give you that boost you need as a creative to look at something like this and be like, okay, yes, these people did it, I can do it too. If you're one of the few film lovers who hasn't seen it yet, what are you waiting for? The truth is, I could almost put the Batman in the same category as Dragon Ball Super Superhero because this film really <laughs> was made for the Batman fan in me. In every single way, Matt Reeves' The Batman felt like the animated series come to thrilling life. I'm glad this movie exists because it gave the character so much life. It gave the world of Gotham so much life. I've gone back to this movie three times and it's long because I just love living in this world. Of course, not for real. I wouldn't really want to live there, but the seediness of it, the dirt and grime, the intensity of the action, the way it's filmed, the score. Robert Pattinson is great. I think he is phenomenal as Batman and Bruce Wayne. I was in euphoria watching this movie. It's everything I love about Batman put on the big screen. Guys, you can probably guess what my favorite film of the year is. I do try to be a little more supportive of art house film, but this year theaters were genuinely in jeopardy. We needed a movie to come in and bring everyone to the theater and save our church. This movie officially broke a record of mine. When I was 14 and I discovered my love of cinema, I've said this many times, it was three movies that year. It was Spider-Man, Minority Report, and finally Signs. All of them had an impact on me in various ways. Signs was a movie I saw five times in theaters because I just kept going back to study it and to learn about film and everything changed for me. I saw Top Gun Maverick six times in theaters. I saw it first with my friend, then I took my mom and then I said, Sam, you got to come see this movie. And my wife came with me and she loved it so much. I realized none of my friends had actually seen this movie except my first friend I saw it with. So I decided I would do that Cinemark private watch party thing. And I rented out an entire auditorium and brought 20 of my closest friends to watch Top Gun Maverick. And that is a cinematic experience I will never forget. Then I took another friend of mine who visited from out of state. <laughs> And then I saw it at the drive-in, which was amazing. That is a great way to watch Top Gun Maverick. There's really nothing I can say about this movie that hasn't been said, but it reminded me of everything that you don't see in movies anymore. A huge star doing real things, cameras actually on jets. I mean, the DP of this film, Claudio Miranda, his primary light source during those aerial sequences was the sun. So he had to check the weather reports to know where the sun position would be, to make sure the actors looked their best because the real actors are going up in these jets, being flown by actual Top Gun pilots, except for Tom Cruise, who's doing his own flying. So he has to check the weather reports to make sure that when they're up there for as long as they can survive it, which is like 15, 20 minutes or whatever, before they just can't take the G-force anymore, if he doesn't get the shot and the actors don't put their makeup on right or their eyeline isn't right, then that entire flight was wasted. And you realize the whole movie was made that way and is still as good as it is. I've already gone down the rabbit hole of listening to podcasts and interviews with the director and the DP and Tom Cruise and everyone involved with the making of the film. And I've loved hearing all of that. But at the end of the day, the reason this is my favorite movie of the year is because it also works emotionally. Goose's son, Rooster, and the Maverick relationship. It's a surrogate father-son story. And the fact that that emotional core is so intact and, and so real to me as I watch it, 
it has an effect on me every single time. It became this thing for me that I just wanted to share with everyone I love, and I haven't had that experience in a very long time. I love this movie. Uh, I know most people really loved it too, and I would love to say that my favorite movie of the year is some like small movie, but honestly, this film did exactly what had to happen for theaters this year. You know, I mean, I enjoyed Avatar The Way of Water. I think it's a lot of fun. I think it's beautiful, but I didn't feel the emotions in Avatar the way that I felt them in Top Gun. Like just the sequence where he has to prove that the flight can be run in under two minutes and 15 seconds. Easily the most tense sequence of the year. Guys, this was a good year for film, and I'm very glad to have shared another year with you. Thank you so much for continuing to watch my channel. Thank you so much for supporting my film early this year, the Kickstarter campaign and everything that went on with that. That was life changing. I can't wait to share it with you guys. We're very, very close to locking and edits. We've still got some VFX work we're trying to get in there. Obviously sound and score and all that hasn't really been touched. We're getting close to feeling confident about an edit and it's a very exciting time and I'm happy to be sharing this time with you. I also want to say that I'm very excited to announce that next year I'm going to be starting a podcast. It's called Pre-Production. I want to thank my buddy Dylan for recommending that title. The concept of the podcast is that I will interview a filmmaker probably twice a month and every filmmaker will talk about that spark that made them want to make movies, whatever it was, whether they were a kid and they saw Indiana Jones on TV for the first time or their mom took them to see Blade Runner, whatever it was that made them realize, holy shit, I wanna do that. And we'll take the listener from that spark all the way to the making of that filmmaker's very first movie. So we'll talk in detail about all of the hardships they went through as a teenager, as a young adult, to get something off the ground. All of the rejections from festivals, all of the no's they had to hear from people, to get that first film off the ground. And then we'll talk about the production of that first film. So the whole idea behind the podcast is like, pre-production is a term for films, but it also feels like you are in a never ending state of pre-production once you decide you want to make films until you finally get one made. It feels like forever. You have to wait and wait and wait. And I'm very excited to talk to filmmakers about that period in their lives, so hopefully I can build an archive of filmmaker interviews for people to listen to for inspiration when they are feeling like they're struggling to get something off the ground or they need that film inspiration. But I'd also love to achieve in the podcast is that eventually in the future, if we record enough episodes and the podcast does well enough, like let's say I got 50 interviews, people can look at this archive of interviews and maybe find even one commonality between all of them that everyone did that helped them break into the industry. Because I think that's one of the biggest mysteries for a lot of filmmakers is how do I get in? How do I do it? And everyone does it differently. But if we can look at all of these people and find a common denominator, that could be helpful. And I think it would just be really fun as well. I've already recorded a few interviews. It'll start sometime next January-ish. It'll be everywhere on all the various platforms. But I'm also going to upload it here as well. So you guys can listen to it here if you want to. It should be fun. I'm looking forward to it and I hope you guys enjoy it when it drops. And I'll let you guys know. Give me like a couple weeks to iron out the details, but I'm excited to bring that to you guys. Thank you so much as always for watching for yet another year. You guys are the best. And if you like this, you can click right here and get stuckmanized.